Welcome to this webinar on supporting test takers with Foundations of Reading teacher certification tests. We will talk about the changes from 90 to 190 and also some of the options that TLA provides for test takers and colleges and universities. I want to tell you a little bit about our aim in this conversation uh, today, and that's really to serve as partners to schools of education in the preparation of pre-service teachers by providing an extra dose of instruction to deepen knowledge of foundations of reading development. Um, I don't know a single school of education that feels like they have enough courses to um, enough time to teach what we need to address that matters so much um, in terms of preparing teachers for the classroom. So, so few places have more than one or two courses. And so we're hoping to kind of be a vehicle to, to add more to that. We also hope to support schools of education in bridging preparation for the classroom with test preparation. I really think that students are most successful when they focus on what matters in the classroom and then have a bridge to the test rather than um, our universities and colleges creating courses that are about test prep. Uh, that's, that's not my point of view. And finally, we wanna help individuals, um, the individual test takers develop their content knowledge, develop test taking strategies, and really have the confidence to take and pass this test. One of the things I'll talk about, and I'm sure so many of you have seen, is the impact on our students who do not pass these standardized tests. That's one of the things that motivates me is to help them learn how to learn, learn how to, um, to, to better prepare for the test and to go in feeling more confident. So I have, um, as, as Lynn mentioned, I've worked uh, through a variety of places, either directly providing instruction to students at, at UMass Boston or working with universities to help prepare faculty as those states have adopted the Foundations of Reading test. As some of you may know, the Foundations of Reading um, test has been in Massachusetts for probably over 15 years now and, and you know, states have kind of come on board with offering the same test. So as some of these states have, have also adopted the Foundations of Reading from Pearson, I've supported them. And I'm now reaching out to do that again as this test has undergone quite an overhaul. So I'm going to start from a place, just so you all know, with an assumption that you already know about the Foundations of Reading um, test, the original one. And while I will go through a quick review of that, um, I would be more than happy to, to, um, to work with you if, if you are new to the test as, a, as an entity in and of itself, but I'm really going to focus this webinar today on assumptions that you already know about it, and I'm really talking about the ships. So we're going to talk about the key changes from 90 to 190, that those are the two numbers that you'll see, um, an overview, some differences in structure, and certainly you'll see some differences in content. I want to remind you of the resources that are available um, related to the practice test from Pearson. I suspect most of you, if not all of you are aware of them, but it's, it's just a good reminder. I have some suggestions for providing a different differentiated approach to supporting test takers. And I really think that that's at the heart of how we can best serve our students. And then of course, TLA has some offerings for working directly with universities as a partner, but also directly with students. And again, if you're just joining us, feel, feel free to add something in the chat. I'm gonna ask you to just hold on to questions to the end or, or put them in the chat and we'll make sure, I'll make sure for time at the end. So for those of you who are just getting familiar with the test itself, it's a four hour computer based test. Again, and also as I, I just a disclaimer, if I'm saying something that you know not to be true in your state, please reach out and say that I, I am pretty familiar with the variations in states, but but not everything. So you may be more of an expert on your state's version than I am. So it's a four hour computer based test. There's 100 multiple choice. There's two open response. The open response has changed. So instead of just saying two open response, they've actually identified it and given different um, descriptors for them, foundational reading skills and reading comprehension. We will unpack that um, a little bit further into this webinar. The passing scores range from you know, 229 in North Carolina, 240 in Massachusetts. So your state um, will have certainly its cutoff score and, and just know that there is a little bit of a range depending on the state you're in. So as, as you're familiar, Pearson created this test um, 
and I don't know why that's not. There we go. Um, it was created by Pier developed by Pearson and the either the original 90 or now the new version, the 190 is in these states across the country. So the exact same test. The ones in bold are the ones that I know of right now that have already discontinued use of the 90 version of the test and are now um, requiring that their students take the newly revised version. I know that that's kind of um, in transition in, in, the other, in the other places. And I expect at least in North Carolina and Wisconsin to see that shift, it's just, um, the timing is a little bit different. As you know, <laughs> the breadth of knowledge that's described as one of the goals of the assessment really comes from the, the five key components out of put reading first. And around the time of the, the adoption of the Common Core Standards, you will see that it's also extended to spelling development, academic language development, oral language and writing strategies, and I don't know why I didn't bold it, but analysis of complex literary and informational texts. So it goes far beyond those five key components to, um, to really the whole continuum of helping children learn to be strategic readers. And you will see, especially in this new version of the test, that it requires knowledge of assessment, differentiation, and intervention and to address the needs of all learners. That was the case with the original test, but and in an analysis of the practice test, um, I can tell you that there's a lot more about differentiation intervention. And I will show you some of that. It's also probably important here to just say that I'm working off of probably the same information that you have. The difference for me is that I've been working with students closely for um, about 15 years. And that may be exactly what many of you out there have been doing as well. Um, but have really spent time not only on the content, but how do I keep shifting and providing uh, some kind of different uh, support for students so that they are successful. So I, I'm working from the same information and I don't have any kind of secret Pearson knowledge to share. Um, so that's just probably important for you, for you to know as well. We're all, we're all kind of in this together. So uh, you know why the Foundations of Reading test is out there. There's there's lots of reasons and, and the ones that are official <laughs> is to make sure that our students can are are using evidence-based instructional decisions when they're working with readers in the classroom. And so this test um, attempts to measure those those uh, that that content knowledge. So let's dive into the differences in, in the test so far. The first one is the breakdown of sub areas is the same for both tests for 90 and 190. And also as a, as a, 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 I should mention that all of these slides I have on a Padlet that I will share with you at the end. So you're welcome to take screenshots or notes, of course, but you'll have access to all of this as well. So the sub areas technically are the same. They're broken down in the same way. They have the same titles. Foundations of Reading Development, which is, you know, the largest section of the Foundations of Reading test. Development of Reading Comprehension, which is vocabulary, um, comprehension of literary text and comprehension of informational text, and reading assessment and instruction. What I want to show you is how those sub areas that look the same are in some ways quite different once you get into this new version. So as I mentioned earlier, 20% of the test is the open response, and now they've divided in terms of the descriptors, each of those into foundational reading skills. They don't say oral reading analysis, so I don't know if we can anticipate that it will always be that. Seems like it will be, but um, foundational reading skills and reading comprehension. And when you look at the description of each of those, there's quite a range of possibilities of what they may assess. And we just don't know enough because not enough people have taken it. There's not enough information that's released by Pearson to know if it will just stick with that oral reading analysis we've expected or if it will change. What I will show you though, is that the foundational reading skill skills open response, that particular component um, is much more complex than it was before. And in some ways that are, is probably good and some ways that I think is, is going to be a, a new leap for our students. So here we are at the changes and let's just dive in. Um, I'm gonna ask my boss, Lynn, 
to just tell me to slow down if I'm talking too fast. <laughs> you know, I'm from New York originally. I'm here in Massachusetts and I know I can speak rapid fire, <laughs> but especially when I'm short on time. So uh, Lynn's gonna slow me down when needed. <laughs> All right, so the first thing is, I want you to know that there's revised language, depth, and focus of the questions. So it goes from understanding something like phonological awareness and phonemic awareness to demonstrate your knowledge and apply your knowledge. Now, we saw that in the original test, but when you see how those questions have shifted, you will see it's, it's quite different in, in terms of what our, our students are expected to know and demonstrate when it comes to applying your knowledge of a skill to differentiating instruction about that skill in the classroom. So let me, let me give you an example here. In the original 90 version of, of the test, one of the um, objectives said, um, you will understand the role of phonological processing in the reading development of individual students, English language learners, struggling readers, and highly proficient readers. Apologize for the comma missing there. So that was at the end of every set of objectives and you're probably familiar with that. Notice the new language that relates to it. And I'm not going to read it aloud, um, but just take a moment to take that in and see the difference in the language. What are some, if you just unmute for a moment, what are some of the words that pop out at you? What are some of the things that you notice? Just anybody just unmute and shout it out. Evidence-based. <laughs> Evidence-based is throughout everything, for sure. Mm -hmm. Differentiation. It's so much about differentiation, which as a staff developer in the classroom, it, that's I can't argue with that. What is hard is for pre-service teachers who haven't had a lot of experience, practical experience in the classroom. So how do we support them with that knowledge before they've even done it? Um, and so you'll see where it says differentiation and it's about classroom interventions and extensions. And it's really also um, uh, delineating who we're talking about when we talk about differentiation in a much more specific and comprehensive way. And I, actually, just to go back to this for a moment, I want to mention that when I looked at the two tests, at first I thought, oh, it's just more language in the objectives. You know, it's just expanding the explanation of each of those objectives. But when you see the practice test that's been released and that I will share with you today, I suspect most of you have seen it, but I have it there for you if you haven't. Um, you'll see that it's more than just semantics in the, in the descriptors, but it actually does show differences in those questions. So, um, there's a lot on this page because it is one question. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna ask you to take a moment to notice when I talk about, uh, when I share, for example, that our students need to be prepared for differentiating um, in the classroom related to those, those foundational skills, and all, all the skills, in fact. Take a moment to read this question. I'm, I'm gonna be quiet. <laughs> and I want you to think through the lens of a couple things. Think about the reading demands on your test taker. Think about the content demands on the test taker and also what they need to understand about instructional moves along a continuum as we support um, different learners. So again, think about the reading demands on the, on the test taker, the content demands and what they need to know about instruction. When you're done, just put done in the chat box and I'll know you're ready.
I know we, we're not all done, but let's let's just start to, to talk about it. So um, anybody have any, well, first of all, why don't I show you the answer? <laughs> we're all testing ourselves too. So D is the answer. And I'm wondering first, what do you notice about the reading demands for our test takers? And again, just, just unmute, share out. You can also put it in the chat if you prefer. We'll kind of monitor that. <laughs> These are a lot of, um, you know, very distinct but closely related activities side by side. It's a lot to hold on to as you read through the choices. It is. It right. So you have to to know the the terminology. You have to be able to visualize this work. That's like the sound boxes, Alconan boxes. Um, you have to imagine each of those scenarios. I like how you said and hold on to it. This is one question out of a hundred. So the cognitive demand of anxious test takers is also quite high. Um, in some ways, the language in this question is easier than some of the other questions, but there's just a lot. There's just a lot. So what I see with our test takers is sometimes it's not just about how to teach reading. I'm sure you've seen this yourself and in the courses you teach, it's also about their own ability to read critically and understand what a question is asking and how, does, how to make sense of something. Um, it's also very nuanced knowledge of um, phonemic awareness, right? You know, it, it, and, and there's an assumption, actually a false assumption by the test that it occurs in this linear fashion when in fact it's sort of, sort of overlapping waves. So it's very nuanced and it, it's slightly inaccurate. So I think you're going to see that there are questions for sure throughout this test that are about a particular philosophy, about an approach that, um, that there's certainly lots of common agreement about, but not in all cases. So the nuance I think is a really good way to put it. It, it takes a, a very deep understanding of this particular activity and the goals and also the trajectory of learning for our young children um, to know what, what would come next. Uh, you know, for example, I was looking at this one with the alphabet letter blocks, and I know that, you know, one of the things we talk about with Alconan boxes is that we want to quickly get letters in the children's hands so that they're pushing and moving actual letters, but pushing and moving actual letters related to those words wouldn't make sense here. So um, I, I, I agree with you about the nuance and the demands on the learner. So as we move on, um, I'm going to see if we get a chance to come back to this one, but just for now, just read the question so you can see at another level what this might look like. And again, the demands on the reader. So just read the question. So again, I just want to point out, we've got um, academic language that's in the questions. Certainly it was before, but you will see new academic language, <laughs> more of it. Um, you also see a lot about children with learning disabilities. You will see a lot about how do we provide appropriate intervention? What's the next step? So in the previous test, it was a lot about what's the next step in a sequence of instruction um, without quite as much uh, information. It was a little bit more about like, what would you teach next to a group of kindergartners. This is much more about how do you differentiate, target, and provide intervention, that tier one intervention, and sometimes tier two. So we'll get back to that. <laughs> if we get back to it, we'll look at that together. So kind of in a nutshell, what I see when I look at the language, the content, and the shifts in those questions, there is more about oral language development in these new questions. There is much more about instructional routines for phonemic awareness and orthographic mapping beyond beginning readers. That term orthographic mapping was not in the original set of objectives. It wasn't in the practice test. It's certainly throughout this practice test. Um, and you'll also see a lot about how do we teach into these skills beyond beginning readers, but there's a whole section now that really does a deeper dive into how do we support beginning readers. And you will see the whole influence of conversations we're having in the field right now around the role of decodable texts and systematic explicit phonics and phonemic awareness. So it's it's all there what you'd, what you'd expect, but just more than we had before. 
you will also see application of instructional strategies for more proficient readers, specifically strategies to promote morphemic analysis and knowledge of syllable types to decode words. I'm going to show you what I mean about the syllable types, but um, that's a, another big leap in this new test is the, the level to which our test takers need to understand syllabication and how to, how to support students with that. You'll also see a lot of technical and academic language within test, test questions and the answers as we just saw before. For example, some of the terms I just pulled out, orthographic patterns, multimorphic, phrase cueing, derivational suffix is not just enough to know a suffix or an inflectional ending, but you'll see um, much more specificity. And there's less of, and we could do, if we had more time, we could have fun thinking about what is there less of. Cueing systems, they're not there. <laughs> they're there when they're the wrong answer. And there's a couple places where using context clues to confirm um, either a homophone, homonym, or uh, a word that you self-corrected, it's appropriate then, but it's very specific about when it is appropriate when it's not on this test. And there, as I will show you in a moment, there's much less, at least in the practice test, about understanding dispositions and dispositions developed in er emergent literacy. And I'll show you why I think that is. So let me unpack those revised objectives for a moment. I, I mentioned before that one, so the last point was just that the language has changed, the questions have changed quite a bit. While the sub areas are the same, I wanna show you how they're, they're different now. So this is the first section, Foundations of Reading Development. So this is back to here. Section one, Foundations of Reading Development, which is 35% of the test. You will see these four objectives. And I wanna point out that what they did was they collapsed the first two objectives from the original test. The first one was on phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. The second one was on the alphabetic principle and emergent literacy. Those have been combined into one objective. What I think the result is, is that you get fewer questions about supporting our emergent readers and more questions on evidence-based practices for phonemic awareness, phonological awareness. I just saw fewer and that's kind of what I'm anticipating is, is probably the, the result of combining those objectives. Then you'll see that objective two, which used to the next objective in, in line was about phonics. Now it's really about beginning reading skills, including phonics, high frequency words and spelling. So there's just more of an emphasis on supporting our young beginning readers. Makes sense, but that's what you'll see. Um, so that, that section's been expanded. And I'm not gonna get into objective three at this moment. I will in a, mo in, a, in a second to show you how much more knowledge is required under objective three. But I do wanna mention that objective four is new. There wasn't a fluency section as you might, have rem might remember. It was, it was incorporated into other aspects. Um, and now it's, it's here kind of on its, on its own. So, in essence, what they did was they kept the same sub area with technically, um, you know, the same percentage, but they revamped it a bit. And, and those are some of the, my takeaways of the ways that they've revamped it. Now, here's an excerpt from objective three, which relates to structural analysis, word analysis for more proficient readers. And I just want you just to see the language. These are just three bullets under just objective three. So you'll see a lot more about orthographic rules. You'll see that our students now need to know the six English syllable types and not only the English syllable types, but evidence-based explicit strategies for teaching syllable types and syllabication skills. And again, back to that differentiation, evidence-based differentiated instruction and classroom interventions and extensions related to those. So just, I just want you to see the red on the, on the page. This is just three out of maybe eight objectives under this, this objective for um, word analysis skills. Let me pause for a moment and see if there's any burning questions so far from what I've just shared about the changes in the objectives and the, um, the language. I will tell you there's so much we could talk about about why and how and do we agree but for now, I just want to know if, if that feels clear or if you have any questions. Okay. Thanks. I can see um, 
lots of notes in here. <laughs> I can't imagine a hundred words like that myself. I know we have to talk to students just as we do in the classroom about stamina and stamina for this deep thinking. So in addition to the depth and complexity that you will now find in those multiple choice questions, the open response has been overhauled. And um, again, I think that some of the changes make a lot of sense, but I do think about the learner and about where they are in their own professional learning and their ability to take all of that in from you know, a continuum of phonemic awareness skills to syllable types and now to a much more complex open response. So let's look at this. Actually, we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, we're going to come back to the open response and how it's shifted in a moment, but there was an overhaul. And I'm not even going to talk about it right now because we could have a whole webinar on the influence of science of reading on the content, but you will absolutely see that throughout, woven throughout the questions. And not only in terms of content, but in terms of philosophy and approach. So I'm going to show you um, some ways in which the science of reading uh, is just, it's important that our students understand um, that a particular perspective. The, maybe the good news is that in my analysis of the practice test scores, it looks like for now, there is a lower threshold for students to pass. Now, when I say the good news, I want our students to have deep knowledge about these these areas of instruction. As Lynn can, can attest and my colleague Missy, who's here with me tonight as well, um, we want our teachers in the classroom to have deep knowledge, just as you do, about content. I do struggle with, again, how much they need to know before they become a practicing teacher and how much is, is reasonable to know before you're actually in there with kids, which certainly supports more, more practicum time and more opportunities to really um, just get your hands in, in, into the classrooms. But let's, let's look at it. So you'll see, and again, you have these slides, you can take a much closer look. And, and I suspect with some of, about, some of you out there who have a lot more knowledge about test design um, than I do, you'll see that the original 90, like here's just an example. If you scored, if you only had 61 to 65 multiple choice cor questions correct on that test, you received a score of 136 on that original test, at least in Massachusetts. And, and you know, I think it could be a little bit different different places. The new version is you would get 177 points for that same number of multiple choice questions correct. At the top end of those numbers, it's, it's about the same, but I think what this shows me is that our students who um, are per per performing poorly on the multiple choice have quite a bit more wiggle room initially. And so maybe we're, we're shifting in terms of some of the complexity of what's on the test, but at the same time, we're, we're giving students a little bit more latitude. The open response has some similar shifts as well, but not quite as dramatic. So what I'm hearing from people who have taken the test recently uh, is that they're passing at rates that I, I frankly wasn't expecting quite yet. And so I'm, I'm hearing that, um, that they are, they're passing, and I think probably the, the lower threshold is, is partially the reason. So just a few more uh, takeaways and uh, um, some big shifts that I see. The foundations of reading, part of the foundations of reading test um, requires deeper knowledge of content, the continuum of learning across skills and knowledge of instructional practices. Um, I'm sure that's not a surprise to you. It's probably a lot of what you're working with your students on, but I do see that's where they're going much deeper. But it doesn't really stop there. You will see that there are fewer right answers that support the role of meaningful independent practice and instead shift toward targeted, explicit, scaffolded instruction, particularly those who struggle. So I'm all for targeted, explicit, scaffolded instruction, but I do think that there's a place for choice, engagement, student ownership, and so on. And, and I don't see many questions that actually um, show that in a positive light. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Um, and balanced literacy and reading workshop, you can imagine, it's just, it's, it's just not, um, it's not, a, those practices that are at the foundation of balanced literacy and reading workshop are largely um, the wrong answers on this test. So an example of that is this question. Um, so just take a moment to look at it. I actually don't have any problem with <laughs> this question, but it does spin balanced literacy and reading workshop in, in a manner that I think is it doesn't do it justice.
So the answer here is B, you probably knew that. And part of the reason you probably knew that was you know about the, you know about, first of all, what good practice looks like and what it doesn't look like. Um, giving kids a bookmark and with some brief descriptions is not explicit. It's not going to help students really apply the strategies that they need when they need them. Um, having students um, apply some of their strategies during independent reading is, I think, a, an appropriate strategy, but the way that they're, it's written is, is not. It wouldn't have them just write their strategy in a reading log. Um, so you're seeing a little bit of my own perspective and philosophy here, uh, but I want to show you that the answers on this test often relate to students or students are led by the teacher, the teachers leading students in frequent small group discussions and close reading and targeting those skills. So there's almost every time I see a question that relates to independent practice or students having their own ideas or applying a strategy, it's, it's often wrong. It often it's more about the teacher leading uh, a, a small group, frankly. And again, we could talk about that all day. Uh, we could have a, probably a good healthy debate about it, but for now, I just want you to know what it is. And that's what I do when I'm working with students is I, you know, we could debate uh, different viewpoints about instruction in the classroom, but this test um, really holds onto a particular philosophy that's really important to know. So I also wanna highlight just the difference between an old question and a new one. So this one is about uh, second graders decoding multi-syllable words. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to have you read it. A lot of you who know the original practice test probably know this question, but it's which of the following strategies would be most effective in promoting second graders decoding of multi-syllable words? And the answer here in this original test, I guess I didn't put it there, is encouraging students to compare parts of new multi-syllable words with known single syllable words. So you might find single syllables within that multi-syllable word. Now I want you to see what's required related to syllabication in terms of our students' understanding. So now I'm gonna give you a few minutes and just put in the chat when you're done. Done. <laughs> Okay, so we have a lot of you. Oh, a lot of you said you were done. Sorry. Anybody want to share what they think the answer is? I think this one is D. Yeah. Now, now I'm doubting myself. D. Okay. So you can see again what our students need to know in order to answer a set of questions like this. They need to understand syllable types. They need to be able to, to identify what each of those sets of words, they need to be able to go through and think about the um, syllable types that are represented there as well as phonics features within them. All right, so now let's shift to the open response. I know this is one a lot of you asked that you wanted to know more about. So notice that the, um, the first one says, prepare an organized developed analysis on a topic related to the development of foundational reading skills. And then instead of the descriptors that we're probably pretty familiar with related to oral reading analysis, it says using your knowledge of foundational reading skills. And there's a range of things from phonemic awareness, high frequency words, morphemic analysis, fluency, rate, all of that's there. Your job as a test taker is to identify a strength and need, which is familiar, familiar to us from the 90 version of the test, then identify an instructional strategy, activity, or intervention to use, and explain why that strategy would be effective. So it looks a little bit like this. 
in this case, again, we have an oral reading analysis. So I, I'm imagining that may continue, but based on the descriptor, we just don't really know for sure. Um, the, the examples that are out there are much more complex than the ones that we saw before. And you also have exhibits, artifacts that relate to this, that help you understand the student um, a bit more. So we have information on rate, accuracy, prosody, and so on. We even have, you know, where the child fell um, according to these norms. And then the student needs to respond to each. What I find interesting in the response is that I have in the past and my friends in Wisconsin will know that I always said, you stick with one strength and one weakness. We're looking for a pattern. And instead what I see in this particular example, and it's only one, so we can't draw too many conclusions, but we can draw some, is that the exemplar that they shared actually has you an analyzing all sorts of things. They know beginning and final consonant blends, compound words, contractions, basic vowel teams, diphthong. And there were some strengths in fluency, speed and phrasing. So in a paragraph, you're talking about anything that you saw that was a little bit, you know, that had some strength. Then there's the need, then there's an instructional strategy, and then you kind of wrap up and explain why that's important. So like me, I suspect what you're noticing is this is important, right? Um, at least that we were talking before, um, friend from Merrimack. And for sure, we want our students to know, what do you do with this data? How do you use your observations of your students to, uh, to inform um, your teaching? But having them be prepared to address all the appropriate instructional moves, depending on anything that, that they, may, they may get on this um, question, is going to require a lot more preparation than than the previous test. So as I wrap up this piece, I'm gonna give us time to talk about some questions that you have and also just some things that TLA is doing to support universities and, and students. I, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of where my passion lies with all this. And one is my support for teachers in this preparation for this test aligns with my beliefs about kids in the classroom, which is that it's about differentiation. What I have discovered, again, I suspect many of you have as well, is that students struggle for different reasons and they need different levels of support. So sometimes it's with content. Do they know the content? Do they understand the application to real life scenarios? Do our students anticipate bias and use this to inform their responses? Um, test taking skills. Are students able to apply their own critical reading skills to the questions and the writing skills that are required? Study habits, I've seen this a lot. Um, do students know what it looks like, sounds like, it feels like to study effectively? I'm sure in your own courses, you see those that are um, more passive than proactive and don't know how to make a plan, don't know how to pace themselves. So for some people, it's really that executive functioning and it's how do you make an independent plan for study? And do they know how and where to get support? And lastly, I'm gonna say um, this, this is personal to me also, and I know it is personal for many of you who work closely with students who, who have failed on multiple occasions. I absolutely believe they are in fight or flight mode when they are overwhelmed, when they approach this test as a bad experience before, and they come to it feeling um, doubtful that they can pass again. So instead of being the most prepared to think critically and thoughtfully about the questions, they are in a fight or flight place. So when I work with students, I'm trying to help figure out which piece do they need. It may not be um, all of them for each, per, you know, it's, it's different things for different people. So um, that's just a little bit of my, my piece about how we, how we think about test prep. So for example, when I think about um, like the study skills in the last year, and this, this goes into a little bit about how TLA is supporting students. In the last year with the pandemic, I don't know if you noticed, if you had that in Mississippi or Arkansas or Wisconsin, but up here in Massachusetts, there was this little thing called a pandemic. Um, what, what, um, what we discovered in, in lots of trial and error with designing options for students online is that there are some people who are good with going with something like self-paced. So we, I have a, a pretty elaborate study guide. Some of you know older versions that I have of it. It's been updated and, and revised quite a bit. 
and I don't think it's out there on the web yet. <laughs> um, some people are fine with the, the study guide and watching video modules, and they just need that content, and they need to see it again and again. So for those of you in institutions that are providing live workshops, I absolutely recommend the option to, to record some of that so your students can go back to content. That's one of the things we spent the last year developing modules for people so that they can hear things and then go back repeatedly alongside the study guide. Um, so for people who want a self-paced option, there's that. And then there are people who really need accountability. My friend Missy, who's here tonight, will talk about those of us who just need an accountability partner. So the way that we've designed that is that there's kind of a start and end time together with a cohort of people. And, and there's kind of interest times when I intersect with them, give them an assignment, here's what you're going to try and do. And what's not mentioned on here, but, but we'll add it, is that alongside each of those modules, we've created test questions that align with the practice test so that they can do a self-assessment that, that looks very similar to the practice test. And that gives me information, that gives the students information. So the, the workshop series is for those people who really need the live interaction, they need the feedback, they need a cohort of peers and accountability across a period of time. Um, so I have a live workshop coming up in October. So of course I'm letting you know that and I hope that you'll share that with your students if you know anybody who might be interested. And before you leave today, we are giving away some registrations to that. Um, more, more kind of exciting though, I think, um, especially based on some of the interest for today's workshop, today's webinar, is we are putting together a consortium called For Future Teachers of university partners um, across the country. We've had a lot of people reach out to us to either consult with them or provide staff development around just some of the ways that you can design workshops for your own students. But I also know that this can be lonely work sometimes where, wherever you are. And so we are facilitating a consortium that um, at its most basic level, we will have some webinars for for co consortium members um, that involve a little bit of teaching, but a lot of collaboration among, among us. And, and I will be having a webinar, for example, just on supporting people with open response. But as part of the consortium, which is $1,500 annually, we are offering a few free enrollments so that you as a faculty member could enroll, um, a discount on any students from your university who take the self-paced or workshop series, so 20% off that. We send you a couple free study guides. And then I'm here also as a resource for you um, to collaborate with. So um, that's something that's also on the Padlet if you're interested in knowing more about how you can be part of this group um, together. Lastly, we um, consult and work with partnership in, in partnership with universities. So it could be that you want to design something unique for your students. Um, and I just want you to, you know, to know about, about that. This is a little bit of the um, a, a sample. It's not super clear to see, but of the video modules, there's something for for all the uh, all the sections on the test. Some are as short as you know nine minutes, and some are 34 minutes. And again, as I mentioned earlier, they go along with the study guide, which looks like this. So let me share with you what I have to give you today, and um, have a a little bit of time for question and answer and just want to um, be sure that, that you get some resources and you leave with hopefully some help today. So I'm going, to, um, I'm going to put a link in the chat box for you to Padlet. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Padlet, um, but essentially it's like a website and I want you to be able to link to those resources. So let me just get that to you. While I do that, feel free to put a question in the chat box. Lynn, I'll ask you if you would be willing to monitor that for me and just unmute if you like. I'm going to put um, that link to all of you for the Padlet. So you'll see on the Padlet, I have the old test, the new test, my slides from today, the flyers for um, some of the things that we offer. And I'm also going to put in a feedback form right now as soon as you fill out that little quick little feedback form, we're going to do um, a raffle. I think I can figure out how to do it um, so that you can have two free enrollments to the workshop series or self-paced, whichever you prefer. So let me just send that off to you as well. 
So go ahead, put a message in the chat or unmute if you um, have a question that you'd like to ask. Or insight that you'd like to share with the rest of the group. We're all in this together. I actually have a question. Yes. Um, you, I wrote something down that you said earlier about a particular philosophy. I mean, and that's, that's extremely evident with this new test that it's going a certain way with a certain philosophy. Mm -hmm. I'm just finding that the students when they're out in the field aren't necessarily seeing that shift in philosophy yet. In, I mean, not all districts have really bought into science of reading. Like so it's a really hard place for these students for this test and then what they're really seeing in the field. Right. So, you know, you probably can tell enough from my own, from my comments on the test, I straddle both worlds. So I come from a place again of working deeply in, in a reading workshop approach with, with children and believe strongly in the evolving understanding based on cognitive science and science of reading about how we target the skills that children need. I think that that is an evolving, <laughs> evolving shift in the field. And I also think, as you know, so much depends on that individual classroom where students are placed, right? So it depends certainly on uh, the district's approach, but it also depends a lot on um, on the individual teacher you're with, right? So you could see that exact example with somebody giving bookmarks and say, here, you know, remember to read the strategies and not be explicit about how and when you use them. Um, we see a lot of poor implementation of good ideas a lot. So I, I agree with you, Marissa. And that's where I struggle with undergrads. You know, they'll say, but I saw this, or, you know, this is what my teacher's doing. And it's just a very hard place to be for them, I think, for the content knowledge in the classroom at the college and then what they're seeing in the field. I agree, I agree, absolutely. Other people, um, I'm wondering if if you um, have had any different ideas or insights. You know, I've shared what, what I've come to know um, and what I've come to believe in working with students, but we're, as I mentioned, we're in this together. A lot of you have a lot of different experiences with students and I'm wondering if you have any different ideas about how to best support your students. All right, so I'm just going to see here, because I'm sure you've all had long days. <laughs> I'm going to take a look at that um, that feedback form, and we'll just to choose two numbers quickly. Once you do that, I'm going to make sure, give everybody a chance to do that. If somebody's still filling that out, I'll give you time so I can, based on just getting those, I'll, I'll choose some, choose a few. Yeah, I'm going to give you a few more minutes. But if you fill that out, what we have is we will give you, um, you know, to distribute to whoever you want at your university or your school or to yourself just to see what, what it is, um, either just the access to the self-paced resources or to the workshop series. And I will, while we're waiting for that, I will put my contact slide up again too. Leave it like that so I can hold on a minute. <laughs> All right, so anybody want me to hold off and wait? Do we have all of you in there? Because I'll wait if anybody's still filling that out. Okay, so let's see. All right. I'm going to ask, let's see, um, Missy, will you choose a number between one and, is there anybody else who's still filling it out? I saw one more just came up. Okay, between one and 24, choose a number between one and 24. Four. 
Okay, four is, that is Tammy Brown. So Bellhaven, we will send you a, Lynn, will you write that down for me? So Tammy will send you um, one free registration and then, um, Bay. Bay. yay, you're a winner. <laughs> Not a gift bag, but it's not a bag of books or a new car, but hey, it could go a long way. Um, and let's see, Missy, will you choose another number between 1 and 24? 14. Okay. You have no idea, everybody, how long it took me to figure out how we might do this today, a raffle. And that's Dr. Catherine Allen from University of Wisconsin at Oshkosh. So there's another one. Woohoo! Yay! yay. <laughs> <laughs> so for anybody who knows me, um, you know that my keeping on a schedule is quite an accomplishment. So I don't know, 757 is pretty good. I am here though, if anybody wants to stay and ask questions, I really hope that you got some questions answered today. I hope I didn't speak too fast. If you are new to Foundations of Reading in general, and, and I talked a lot about assumptions I was making about your knowledge, feel free to reach out and um, I'd be happy to support you with just getting up to speed to start. So I just am really honored that you were here today with us and we're in this together and I just wish you all health and well, <laughs> wellness as you continue in this next year. Thanks everybody. <laughs>